this month, I'm taking a look at Nintendo Power number four, uh, 57 for February of 1994, featuring another Sunsoft Warner Brothers game. Our cover game this issue is Bugs Bunny Rabbit Rampage, featuring bugs and a lot of paint cans. I don't talk about the table of contents very much, but this issue bears mentioning. In this issue, like the previous issue, we have seven Super Nintendo games listed, technically more if you count the sports roundup, two Game Boy games, and only one NES game. The NES is definitely at the low ebb, on, on its way out, and the Game Boy upcoming games, there aren't quite heavy enough to give a more gregarious coverage to that system. In the letters column, we have a David Letterman-style top ten list. <clears throat> we start this issue off with the cover game, Bugs Bunny, Rabbit Rampage. This game is an adaptation of a bunch of Bugs Bunny cartoons, like the Duck Dodgers game was. With the difference being that the Duck Dodgers game was a... all the cartoons were thematically linked to each other. Whereas here, it's just a series of vignettes based on specific uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons. This game... this doesn't get level maps, but it does have notes on several levels. This is a very chaotic game. The sprites are large and very detailed, but there is a lot going on on screen at once, and the game is never really great at communicating what enemies you can permanently defeat, and what enemies you should bypass while you're making your way to the finish, and once you've reached the boss, it doesn't communicate how much damage you've done to the boss, if you've done any damage at all, and how close you are to defeating them. This is frustrating. Part of the issue is, all, is a lot of the generic enemies can't be beaten, only stunned. Consequently, the conclusion you get from your attacks is the best they can do is stun their enemy. So when you reach the boss, you don't know if you're damaging the boss, you don't know what you have that could damage the boss, and you don't know how effective those attacks are if they're doing any damage at all. It's a shame, because Rabbit Rampage's character and style in spades. If I was going to do a retroactive, giant bomb-style Game of the Year list for this year, this game would absolutely be in the running for best style. It's a game made by people who love Looney Tunes cartoons and want to give players the experience of playing a bunch of Bugs Bunny cartoons. It's a shame this title just can't quite pull it off. Next is Young Merlin from Westwood and Virgin Interactive. The game appears to be something of an adventure game, modeled after Zelda. The guide gives maps of some early dungeon levels. Young Merlin, as an adventure game, can't decide if it wants to aggressively hold your hand or leave you complete here on your own, and it doesn't help that it's not particularly great at performing, providing feedback, which leads to some of the problems like those I had earlier with Bugs Bunny Rabbit Rampage. If you don't provide visual, visual or auditory feedback for whether your attack is doing any damage, then you don't know if you're on the right track or not, or if you should try something else. It really shows how much the language of game design has progressed and hasn't progressed over the past few years since the launch of the NES, and how it's adapting to 16-bit systems and where certain developers fall in the progression of this. Skyblazer is next, and it appears to be a action platformer, like the side-scrolling parts of ActRaiser. Skyblazer is really good. We have fluid animations, interesting traversal mechanics, and a pretty nice amount of game balance that makes the levels just difficult enough when it promotes exploration by the player, which makes for a really fun game. Unfortunately, as with all games like this, it's incredibly expensive, you guys. We're talking like 75 to 100 dollars loose. That is insane. And it'd be hard to recommend this game unless it ends up on the Switch's version of Virtual Console, because it's not on the Wii U or Wii. Because, again, it controls incredibly well, the environments are expansive, they're, the difficulties balance just right so that you aren't penalized for getting off the beaten truck path. It's, it's perfect. But it's way, way too expensive for this game. Honestly. The magazine has another licensed title with Inspector Gadget, a platformer based on the cartoon. The article has maps and notes for the first three stages, and just notes for levels four through six. Inspector Gadget is a platformer that looks like an Amiga or PC platformer, but manages to get the console-style platforming right in terms of jump physics and that sort of thing, which is exactly what I want in a platformer. Controls are fine, and level design is pretty good. The game uses gadgets well, gadget abilities for some neat traversal challenges, 
in addition to fighting enemies. It's a nicely done game. I'm not exactly a must-buy for me, but it's definitely something that is actually pretty good. I'm rather impressed by this compared to some of the other licensed games we've gotten outside of stuff from Sunsoft. We have our seasonal sports lineup this issue with a slew of titles, and I think I'm actually going to cover them all this time. Winter Extreme Skiing and Snowboarding is first up, and it's interesting because it's not what you expect when you think of games around these sports. It's not a trick-based race game like SSX, which makes sense, the systems around this time couldn't really handle it, but neither is it a downhill slalom race like, well, slalom or numerous other games for the Nintendo, nor is it a collection of mini-games like Summer Games, Track and Field, or Skate and Die. No, this is a point-to-point, beat-the-clock race like OutRun. The route even splits after each checkpoint like an OutRun. It's really a neat idea, but I have some issues with the execution. Because this is a home version of an arcade-style game, there are some things the game could do to make for a better experience, like giving a number of lives where if you run out of time, you restart with a full 60 seconds at the last checkpoint, with the opportunity to try another route or try the same route again. That would give you an opportunity to make beat the game not just in one run, particularly, um, again, since you're playing this in the home. If you can't beat the game with the number of lives, you still have to start over from the beginning again, but otherwise, like, this is a case where I'm okay with having a continued or something equivalent, a limited continued or something equivalent to that. Next up is Winter Olympic Games Lillehammer 94, a game I could not do particularly well at because there aren't any facts for the game with the controls, nor are there any instructions on how to control the game and the game itself, nor could I find, reasonably find a scan of the manual. So I'm using somebody else's gameplay footage to actually showcase the game while I tell you that if you're going to pick this up, hunt down a boxed copy, or at least one with a manual, so you can actually play it. As we're now at the point with the with 16-bit games, because we have more buttons than the NES, it is harder to guess your way through how you play the game based on the number of buttons you have on the controller. Riddick Bow Boxing is a title that really put some wear and tear on your hand. It's a game that definitely aimed to be more of a simulation than some of the other boxing titles that came out for the Super Nintendo, with the controller using the face buttons for left and right hooks and jabs, and the shoulder buttons handling how you weave and dodge. The game was also good at communicating information in terms of you and your opponent's stamina and health. That said, the game does have a problem. Your attacks don't wear down your stamina, particularly, nor does blocking particularly do any chip damage. If it was one or the other, that would be fine, because if you if blocking had chip damage but your attacks didn't do any stamina, it discourages turtling. If blocking didn't cause chip damage, but punching did do stamina, then it gave you gives you an incentive to work around your opponent's guard and also makes the rope a dope a actually viable strategy in the game. But instead, turtling doesn't ha exactly help you because the game gives out points at the end of each round, but mashing attack buttons on your opponent doesn't hurt you either, so... Again, it's, it's kind of a mess. I think I've reached, figured out my criteria for what a boxing game really needs to have to be a good simulation. If you can do the Elite Foreman fight in the game, then it works. Because Ali's strategy in the Foreman fight was against seemingly all conventional wisdom in boxing at the time, yet it worked. Moving on, we have Brett Hall Hockey. It has two things going for it. It has licenses for the NHL, and the fact that it is fully forced commentary by Al Michaels. Other than that, the graphics are okay, and the controls almost work, except when it comes to passing and shooting. Now, there aren't any facts for the game, and I can't view the controls in the game itself, but from what I observed in play, passing and shooting are done by the same button, and instead of passing directly to another player, you are just launching the puck in a particular direction and hoping there's a player there. What makes this an issue is that there doesn't seem to be a particularly straightforward way to do this on the diagonal. 
instead of with you only shooting in the four cardinal directions. Which means that only you can shoot the puck, or the only way you can shoot the puck is straight ahead, and that in turn makes it hard to score any sort of goal. Also, you can't pause the game, which makes it rather hard to sub out players. If in fact the controls are more complex and more subtle than this, please provide a link to the game's manual in the comments, and I'll revisit the game at the end of Volume Roundup. Intercepted by Pro Sport Hockey for the Super Nintendo, on the other hand, is the far superior game. Your shots on goal are always at the goal no matter where you are, so it's just a matter of positioning yourself to take your shot, and also passing is strip quick and straightforward. Controls are great, and there's a good sense of momentum to your movements on the ice. That said, for some inexplicable reason, the game doesn't show your score on the time remaining on screen. And this is a problem that's unique to the Super Nintendo version. There's an NES version of this game, and I reviewed it a while back, and that game kept the score and time remaining on the bottom of the screen. This is a decision that just doesn't make any sense. Knowing how much time is remaining and how much of a lead your opponent has is an important part to figuring out what strategy you're going to do in a sports game. So, that that's a mess. Sports Illustrated Baseball and Football for the Super Nintendo is a piece of crap that can't do either right. We're doing a kickoff, your defensive line allows 100 yards touchdowns against AI opponents, and there are no clear ways to switch players to someone closer. When you on the kickoff, on the other hand, you get a more reasonable 20 yard uh, return. Or maybe a little further if you're lucky and get some good movements. When you control plays and do kickoff returns, like, again, it, not just for the punt return as well, passing plays, running plays, that sort of thing, you get almost the amount of progress that a normal football game would have, except the defense is extremely tough no matter which opponent you're against. With passing plays, the game apparently tries to show you when you have a receiver open, but you don't actually have enough time to get off a pass before they are in so much coverage that they are no longer open. The baseball part of the title is either so wonky that it can't be emulated, or it's a buggy mess which crashed incredibly early in the game. I honestly have no idea how Nintendo approved this game for release or why. This is one of the few Super Nintendo games I have played thus far that have been featured in Nintendo Power Magazine that felt like a bootleg, an unlicensed third-party game, and this is a game with the license of a major sports magazine. Next we have ABC Monday Night Football. Now, I have a question for you, viewer. Imagine that you are a football player and you have gotten the ball, be it a handoff, lateral pass, or have received the ball through a conventional pass. There are now a bunch of very large, angry men rushing at you, attending to do you harm. Do you A. Walk leisurely away from them, B. Jog at a brisk but relaxed pace, or C. Run like hell? If you chose C, you are in fact not the developers of ABC Monday Night Football. Your character's default speed with the ball is a leisurely walk, with the option to speed up to a brisk jog if you mash B as if your life depends on it. Not hold down B, mash it. This leads to a football game that is only really playable if you play the game with a turbo controller, and I'm not sure why. The th there were decisions made that made the game the way that it is, and I don't understand the reasoning behind it. Most baseball games allow you to play through a full nine or more innings of baseball, occasionally cutting the game short if there's a blowout. Relief pitcher, for some goddamn reason, decides that what you really want to play, especially if you're doing a full season, is to only play the last inning of a baseball game. There is the option there to play a game with the full nine innings, but that is only for an exhibition game. That said, the game controls pretty well, and it does some interesting stuff. I like the fact that the game effectively uses a click wheel for pitching, which is something I haven't seen anyone else do before, and which works remarkably well. The game is also played entirely from behind the batter's back, but the game also handles automatic fielding fairly well as well, shifting the focus of gameplay from the overall baseball game, fielding, pitching, that well, fielding and that sort of thing, to just a battle between the pitcher and the batter. My primary complaint with the actual gameplay is, aside from in season mode, you can only play the last inning, is that the animation for the batter feels sluggish, making it hard to find the timing, especially for a particular pitcher. 
This is why doing season mode as a single inning is such a problem. You don't have enough time to figure out the timing in a single inning. You are effectively required to play exhibition matches against each of the other teams so you can learn their timing before you move into career mode. Next up is BCA Presents Championship Pool. Now, this is a decent pool game with pretty straightforward versions of 8-ball and 9-ball you can play, either with another player as or against the computer as an exhibition game or as a tournament. The physics looks good, and I like the option for a zoomed-in mode to help you kind of identify what, what, how you're lining up your shots and that sort of thing. But the game has some problems with when it comes to playing the computer. When the computer gets a turn, their shots are simulated completely off-screen, so they don't have to run into the same sort of physics that you run into, which means that when you get a bad table position and the computer gets a turn, there's a sense that like the computer is cheating. They may not be, it may be completely legit processing all the shots behind the scenes, but since I can't see it take the shots, I can't tell that. Side Pocket, on the other hand, lacks some of the quality of life improvements that Championship Pool has, like shot prediction, where it not only predicts your path of your shot, but also where the ball is going to go after it. So instead you only see the path of the cube, not the first ball it hits. Single player is also an effectively solo experience, as you're not playing against an AI opponent. Instead, as this is an arcade port, you're in something of a score race, trying to score as many points as possible by sinking full balls, with the chance to score additional points by landing trick shots, putting the ball in a highlighted pocket when the game prompts you. Where the arcade experience comes in is that you have a limited number of shots you get total. Once you're out of shots, you're out, so you keep playing until you run out of shots and you aim for the top score. This makes for a not very satisfying single-player experience, but something fun to play with a friend instead. Moving away from sports titles, we have Nestor the Unlikely, which is something of a cinematic action game like Flashback and Prince of Persia, but with a less physically empowered protagonist. The article has level notes for the first 15 levels. I will give this to Lester the Unlikely. It has very well done animations. That said, the game has very poor level design and equally bad controls. I can forgive having animations that demonstrate Lester is something of a schlub, and not the impressive physical specimen that the Prince in Prince of Persia is, for example. But the game has falling damage, and the game does not provide options to hang down from ledges and drop like the prince does in Prince of Persia, mm. nor do you have a way to look down from a ledge to tell what's below. Mm. This leads, for example, to one part of one level leading to two successive, unavoidable, cheap hits in a row, both caused from dropping down from ledges that you have to drop down from to proceed, which is an issue because you can only take three hits before you die. Additionally, the game has limited continues, which is, as I've stated repeatedly over the course of this series, is something that you do not need on home console games. I like that they're trying to do something of a subversion of the standard cinematic action platformer. They just executed on the concept very poorly. We have Choplifter 3 next, which is a new Choplifter game with maps of the first four levels. Choplifter 3 is a much more involved choplifter. That is itself not a bad thing. You have ni a nice variety of power-up weapons to help you take out enemies, while regular enemies, ground troops, respawn. Major enemies like tanks, APCs, and artillery pieces don't. The game also appears to have unlimited continues, so you can make it through the game without too many problems. Further, the continue system is set up, so it takes you to the start of the current stage chunk, as opposed to the start of the larger overall stage, as is what normally happens when you use a password. This gives an incentive to keep playing instead of giving you a major setback when you run out of lives. My main complaint with the game is that when you are facing to the left or right or moving forward, your forward angle is not steep enough to hit enemies on the ground effectively. If you need to take out a ground target, it is generally more effective to go into a narrow profile and just try to vertically bomb the target which can get really tedious. So Virgin Airlines and a few other airlines have in-flight entertainment computer systems with Super Nintendo games. That's neat, but you probably only get to take advantage of this if you're flying first class. 
So, if you got to use one of these, please share your experiences in the comments, but I'm willing to bet that you didn't. In classified information, we have a revised invulnerability code for Alien 3. New comic this issue? We have a Super Metroid comic from the same guy who did the Star Fox, Fox comic. This installment adapts Super Metroid's prologue, but with considerably more dialogue. Samus is much more talkative in this comic. In the Counselor's Corner column, we have some questions about food management and the strength test hallway in Dungeon Master. Next is an article on Nintendo's smart platform, which is Nintendo's attempt to get kids into politics, which I feel is an attempt to counteract the negative publicity building around video games around this time. A, a proactive, good PR-looking step, as opposed to um, Howard Lincoln going before Congress and actively trying to kick Sega under the bus uh, step. Moving on to Game Boy titles, we have Spider-Man and X-Men in the in Arcade's Revenge, a portable version of the Super Nintendo game, which makes for our first, or one of the our first, Super Nintendo to Game Boy ports. The guide has level maps for Spidey, Wolverine, and Gambit stages. The platforming in this version of the game is incredibly frustrating and makes the game really aggravating to play, making a game that was unpleasant and clunky on consoles into something that is absolutely infuriating. Don't play this game. Our second Game Boy game is Barton the Beanstalk, a new Simpsons game which is only tentatively connected to the, to the TV series. Barton the Beanstalk is a very poorly put together game. The camera movement actually lags behind the movement of your character, leading to situations where you end up right on top of enemies before you can actually see them. The further the levels are designed with a bunch of precise platform jumps in mind, but without the controls or movement to reflect those jumps. This is not helped by the developers not managing to find that balance between large expressive sprites and a field of view that allows for players to see what's coming that a lot of other third-party developers have figured out by this time. So, yeah, it's another really terrible Simpsons licensed game. So skip it. Wrapping up the games for this issue is Star Tropics 2 for the NES. There's information on the new mechanics as well as maps of some of the early levels. Star Tropics 2 is a pretty good sequel to the first game, tweaking the mechanics from the original title while keeping the structure somewhat familiar. But unlike the first game, where you're going through various tropical islands with NPC characters filmed themed around that general concept, you're traveling through time and space, meaning characters will vary heavily from section to section. The gameplay is well enough, though it's a bit of a slog in the early going, as the game gives you something similar to random encounters, except instead of being something that helps you build up strength, they end up being something that merely drains your health. In the top 20 rankings, Mortal Kombat retains the top spot on the Super Nintendo, but Street Fighter 2 Turbo is closing up. In the now playing column, of note in the Ulcer Rants is Super Chase HQ. Finally, in Pack Watch, we have information on Blackthorn for the Super Nintendo from Blizzard and the Koei Revolutionary War strategy game Liberty or Death. My pick of this issue is Skyblazer, if you can find a copy at an affordable price. If you can't, I mean, it's a good game, but it's not that good. It's not like $100. If you can't find a copy at an affordable price, Shoplifter 3 is a little more accessible. I found a bunch of copies around it of it floating around the place, including my own personal copy, which I got around for like $10, $15. I that was a few years ago, but still. It should be at the very least sub $30, even considering uh, NES or Super Nintendo cartridge price inflation. Next issue, we get the Nestor Award nominees and the Super NES version of the predecessor of a game which came out this year. All well, this year being 2017.
thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.